So now that we have completed the Sprite Sheet class, let's go ahead and turn our attention to the actual Sprite class, and that's what we're going to be creating in this video. All right, this class is, of course, going to be placed inside of our engine folder. So this is where we're going to add our new item, and the item name will simply be Sprite. Now, something to go along with this class, since we are going to be handling a loop event, I'm also going to add in the delegate that I'm going to call notify handler, and this is just a simple empty event handler. I'm going to store that in a separate CS file just to keep things clean because it is so generic in nature mm -hmm. that it doesn't make sense to put it into Sprite when all it is is an empty event handler. So I'm also going to go up to engine. We'll add one more new code file. This is... Um, Matter of fact, I'll just make it a, uh, oh, we can begin with a class. It'll be events.cs, just in case we ever come up with some more types of handlers that would be useful. I am, however, going to take out all of the using statements and remove the class because all we're going for here is the declaration of a delegate. This will be delegate void notify handler. Nifty, nifty. And let me, once again, time for some spelling. <laughs> and that is, in fact, notify handler. Cool. And also, of course, after the sprite lessons, this is pretty much the exact same thing as we had done in the sprite animation lesson when we started covering events using sprite looping. So really just the same scenario. It's just that some of the code here is so simple that instead of copying files blindly, we'll just go through through the motions one more time so that everything makes sense in the context of Space Fighter. But now that we have this delegate in place, we now have it ready for use inside of the Sprite class. So what we'll do is we'll move back over to Sprite and let me get my using statements set up appropriately, uh, appropriately for the Sprite. I'm going to take out collections.generic and text because we shouldn't be using those. We're going to need the types that are found in framework and framework.graphics from X and A. So I'll put in using statements for Microsoft.xna.framework and framework.graphics. All right, inside of the sprite class, we need to set up a set of fields. The first few of them will be private fields, and we'll begin with the sprite sheet that this instance of sprite is associated with. So I'll make a field of type sprite sheet and we'll simply call that sheet. And we'll add in an integer value to hold the current frame. And we'll also add in a double, which is going to hold the amount of time remaining before we advance to the next time, or excuse me, next frame. So that will be frame time remaining. Now we'll have a few um, public fields. These will be the origin vector2 field and the event for looping. So we're going to put in a public vector2 for origin. And the reason I'm making this public is it is, of course, useful to be able to gather the origin of a given sprite when we try to, say, center things on other things, align something to the edge of the screen, or see whether or not an object in question is off screen. And we're also going to have, of course, uh, the event itself, the loop event. So this will be a public event of type notify handler, and the name of this field is loop. Now, just to give a quick idea of where looping fits into Space Fighter and why we would want a loop event, is we want to be able to have animation cycles drive certain things inside of the game. A good example of this is the explosions that we'll be adding to the game. We'll actually be adding a type of node that acts as an effect node, and its job is going to be to use the animation to know when an explosion is over. Because when an explosion is over, we want that node to just completely go away and remove itself from the list. And we'll do this by subscribing to the loop event. This type of explosion node will subscribe to loop, and whenever a loop for its sprite occurs, it will handle that event and remove itself from the list. And that way we'll have an explosion that spawns, it exists for the duration of its animation cycle, and then goes away after the animation is done. So, 
moving on from here, we're going to need to add some properties and maybe another field. Um, the reason I'm going to be putting this field in later is because it goes hand in hand with its property and there is some code inside of that property for some considerations that it requires. Though the properties we're going to begin with are the width and height properties for the sprite instance. These will be public integer properties beginning with width. And width is used so that if we're looking at the sprite from outside, we can look at it as an animated sprite and tell what its dimensions are. And really what those are going to tie into is what is the tile width and tile height of its sprite sheet. Because that's of course the size of a single cell. So width is going to have a get accessor. That get accessor is going to return the current instances sprite sheet, so value sheet dot tile width. And then we'll end off the bracket for the get accessor and then end off the bracket for the overall property. So let's grab that property. I'll copy and paste it so that we can set up a similar property for height. And height is going to be accessing the current instances dot sheet dot tile height. All right, moving on from within height, one other thing that we need to be able to access from within the sprite is the texture that it's using. The collision code is going to need to have access to the actual pixel data from the texture used so that we can do per pixel collision detection. And so, of course, the texture is stored way back in sprite sheet. So sprite will read sprite sheet and hand back a texture 2D as appropriate for the given texture that's being used. What I mean by that is we're actually looking at an array of textures when we're looking at sprite sheet, but we're only going to pass one texture when we're passing from sprite. So this property is going to be of type texture 2D. It is not an array, and it's simply called texture. And this property's get accessor is going to need to return a texture. We get textures from sprite sheet, which is held in this instance's sheet field. Now sheet, of course, has multiple textures, possibly one or two, depending on whether or not we have a damage texture. And we use a specific field to get that value out. So at the moment, the um, what's interesting here is we'll get to that field here in just a minute. So we don't we don't know if we need a one or a zero or whatever. I'll actually leave this as question marks. Okay. Just to note that we have to come back to it. It is in fact a blatant error at the moment. Reason being is we will fill this in with a value that will get the appropriate texture because um, just to point out that, of course, sprites are going to handle whether or not they use the damage texture on an individual basis. Of course, if you have many asteroids on the screen and you damage one of them, you only want to see the damage texture appear for that one asteroid, not for all of them. So that means that the state that tells which texture to be used needs to be stored on a sprite-by-sprite -sprite basis. And this brings us up to the next field, and that is the texture index field. So let's drop that down as a private variable. I'm actually going to make this an unsite integer. So I'll make uint texture index. And I'm going to set up an associated property. And the reason I'm setting this up is while reading it is easy, we do have some considerations when setting it. Since this texture index is used to point to an element within the sprite sheet's textures array, we want to make sure that that value doesn't somehow get out of range. At the moment, we know that there's exactly two, so we can do some range checks, and beyond that, make sure that the, the texture we're trying to point to is in fact set. So I'm going to make a public property to access texture index, and we'll drop in both a get and set accessor. And I need a type on yeah. that property, and that type is going to be unsigned integer. Now we can begin with the get accessor, which is easy. That will simply return this dot uh, texture index. So again, just a an accessor to the field. The set accessor is where things get a little bit more interesting. Inside of the set accessor, we need to make sure that this index that we're trying to set is valid. So we'll do an if statement to one, make sure that it's within range given the number of textures held in the sprite sheet, and two, make sure that that specific element is in fact holding a texture that is not null. So the check is going to be if the given value, again, the, the value that we're trying to set texture index to, is less than our sprite sheet's textures length. 
And I'm le reading that as length instead of just hard coding in two because we know from inside of a sprite sheet that texture is, is set to an array length of two. I'm going to leave it length and that makes it so that there are fewer things to change if we ever decide to change the sprite sheet class. So that will perform a range check. I also need to do a check and make sure that the current element is not null. So we could say if our if value is less than our length and the this instance is sprite sheets uh, textures sub value is not equal to null. So if the value we're trying to access is not null, then we know that there's an, a valid texture sitting there and we can use it. So we'll block in, as a matter of fact, I don't think we have to block in this if statement. I think we can just do this in one line. If these checks have passed, that means we can now store value in texture index. So this dot texture index is set to value. And that should take care of the texture index property. Now, a few more properties. I think it should be one more property, and we'll have properties out of the way. If you remember from the original sprite class, the frame bounds property is really at the heart of the animation system. It's what drives the, uh, the way frames are accessed. And I'm pausing for just a moment because I've noted that we have not yeah. yet corrected the error. I was about to I was about to suggest right before you got on to before the next uh, property that we're going to be putting in place. Do you want to go ahead and readdress that line now that yes, we can? Yes, yes, I do. The um, whenever we get it, we ask for a texture. We want to get the correct texture, whether it's the damaged one or the normal one. So in order to do that, we need to get whatever textures sub texture index. Perfect. So we use texture in index to store which one, get that texture, and pass it back. So with that filled in, we no longer have a blatant. The subtexture. bottom line is, what's our current texture? Is it zero or is it one? You know, if that's it, if it is a damageable type texture, exactly. it has two textures being stored in the texture array. And then here, it's just all a matter of setting our texture index. Well, what if we did not have a damageable texture? So, and somebody tried to pass in a one, and we don't have a damaged texture being stored in there. So, all Logan is doing in the texture index property is simply verifying if we're going to set a value, making sure that we can and indeed set that value. And that value that gets set at some point later in time is what's used in determining what texture we're returning. Exactly. We're just being careful when we're setting these values and making sure that it doesn't go and point to an invalid element. That's right. Well, with that in place, now we can move on to frame bounds and get some of the uh, animation, I guess you could say, cell access code in place. And once again, this is almost identical to the frame bounds property found within the original sprite class. The key difference here is that a lot of the values, a lot of the fields given, are actually stored in sprite sheet instead of in sprite. But this is going to be a public property. It is of type rectangle, and it's called frame bounds. And frame bounds is going to have a git accessor. And that get accessor should return a rectangle that covers the specific cell of animation out of the overall sprite sheet. So we'll make two local variables, an integer x and y, to give the coordinates of that rectangle. And begin with x, where x is equal to our current sprite's frame modulus the number of tiles in x. So that way once we hit the edge, we'll wrap back around to the beginning so we can advance down. And the number of tiles in X is based on the sheet, that is this instance's sprite sheet dot tiles X. I'll we'll multiply that against our sheet dot tile width. Of course, so if we advance zero, then one, then two, multiply that against width and move entire tiles per uh, update. And that takes care of X. I'll copy and paste the line for Y. So our y coordinate is going to be equal to frame divided by sheet dot tiles x multiplied by the tile height. And since we're using integer division, we'll of course stay at zero until we advance one full row. Then we'll set to one, and basically just the uh, truncation allows us to access things row by row. That's right. And once again, we have carefully covered the logic behind this math in the past. Exactly. Now that we have our x and y values, we can assemble a rectangle and return it. So I'll go ahead and drop the return in. And we are returning a new rectangle with coordinates x, y, 
We need to give a width and height, which we already know because we have access to tile width and tile height, as sheet dot tile width and sheet dot tile height. And that should give us our current frame bounds for the given frame or for the current frame. All right. Now we should be done with properties. We can move into the constructor for the sprite class. This public constructor is going to take in precisely one parameter. It's simply going to need to know what sprite sheet should it use. So I'll drop in our public constructor for sprite. And that is going to take in a sprite sheet, which we will call sprite sheet. So the first thing that we'll do inside of the constructor is store that sprite sheet in our sprite, or excuse me, in our sheet field. So this dot sheet will be equal to the given sprite sheet. Now we need to do a few more things. We also need to store the, uh, or excuse me, initialize the frame time remaining to the time interval of an entire frame. And we can get that by setting this dot time, or excuse me, frame time remaining. So frame down to eyes. So frame time remaining, that is equal to the current frame interval. Frame interval is of course stored in the sprite sheet. So the given sheet dot interval, or excuse me, frame interval. And one final thing we need to initialize is the origin. I will point this out as a bit of a divergence just from practice in past projects. We have very often made a property that represented origin. And that property would do the math necessary to take and find the center of the current texture. Since uh, in all the development of Space Fighter, I never ran into a scenario where I needed to swap that out or otherwise calculate it dynamically. I decided in this case to simply store it as a field, and that way the math is only run once per construction of an instance instead of being run every update. So we do need to initialize the field. So this dot origin will be initialized here. So it'll be equal to a new vector two, where we will take into account the tile width and tile height values and divide those by two to find the center of our current sprite. So that is looking into our sprite sheet. And that will grab sprite sheet dot tile width, divide that by two. And we're looking at sprite sheet dot tile height divided by two to grab our y value for the origin vector. So finish that off. And I think that really wraps up the constructor to the sprite. Again, make sure we remember our sprite sheet, set up our frame time remaining so that the entire time duration is played out for the first frame and making sure that we have our origin set up appropriately. So I believe we're now to a point where we're going to have to deal with the update and the draw methods, and this is where we can probably borrow some code that we've created in the past. The update and draw methods are going to be so similar to their originals that I'm actually going to load up that original sprite class that we had pointed out in the project video. We'll simply grab those methods, drop them in, and make a few minor changes so that they work inside of Space Fighter. So what I've got is an extra instance of Visual Studio open, and I'll use that to view the sprite class. Once again, this is the class in our temp folder, which we had originally gained from the sprite loop event project. We'll drop this in place, and we're looking for two methods. We're looking for the methods update and draw. So I'm simply going to copy both of those methods, go back to the Space Fighter project, and put those in place. Now, like I said, there's a few things that need to be changed. And this mainly deals with the fact that frame count, or excuse me, fr fields like frame count and frame interval are now held in sprite sheet instead of in sprite. As a matter of fact, we can probably get the compiler to point these out to us if we attempt to build. We'll note that these are in fact the fields that it's having problems with. I'm also going to slightly change the logic in the frame detection just to make it read a little bit more clearly. What I'm going to do is I'll change the expression around so that instead of subtracting one, I'll simply check to see if this dot frame is greater than or equal to the frame count. Now, where does frame count come from? Well, that's from the sprite sheet. So this dot sheet dot frame count. And when we get down to setting the frame interval, that once again comes from the sprite sheet 
and we can access it through the sprite, or excuse me, through the frame interval property. Everything else can be left the same. This includes things like advancing the frame, um, so resetting the frame back to zero if we are in fact looping, and since we are looping, we'll fire off the loop event if it has indeed been set for this instance of sprite. Then we set the frame time remaining back to its frame interval, interval value, and we're ready to do the whole cycle over again. The draw method should have no changes needed. Very it's nice. exactly the same as it was in the original version of the sprite class. If we build now, we can see that that has taken all of our errors away, and that now has our sprite class assembled such as we need it inside of Space Fighter. Yeah, so now we have the ability to instantiate a sprite and reference existing sprite sheets. So with that, that is going to wrap up this video. Thanks a lot.